the beginning of January 2020, wow, well, I was on a cruise ship with my family, Mexican Riviera, celebrating the new year, the new decade, everything that was going to be possible in that year with 5,000 other people. And uh, wow, who knew that it would be anything different, you know, than extraordinary. And, you know, all the things that were possible coming into fruition that year with business and family and I didn't think anything other than it was just going to be a great year. And just in a blink of an eye, we had to adjust to a whole new world. I mean, without any preparation and um, any warning, overnight we were automatically just shut down, sheltered in place meaning not leaving your home, stay where you are, work where you are. Um, I'm just thanking God that our team had started a work remote option so that we were able to pivot in that quick time frame to continue doing work and being productive. Businesses had to change. I mean, we had to help some of the businesses that we support uh, pivot because they weren't on technology platforms and restaurants weren't using that platform to the magnitude that they needed to in order to sustain their businesses that were used to having incoming traffic. Airport shut down completely. Concessions shut down. I mean, overnight, or our world literally shut down um, with the global pandemic. And the whole story that we're capturing started with a conversation with a couple of my colleagues to talk about like, just how we were living history. I mean, we all were saying we are living history in this moment and that we needed to document the story. We're living through history and, you know, Shonda, you know, given your business, um, we got to figure out a, a way to capture this Yeah. Um, because this is history um, and, and we've got to be able to, to tell this story. Um, especially because, you know, black and brown people need to understand, you know, they need to hear it from our perspective and through our lens. But we definitely knew we needed to talk about the story and the impact that it was having on the community and especially the African-American community. I started calling people to find out their stories, people that I knew that owned restaurants and teachers and elected officials and community people and people who are in college and people who are in law school, friends of mine who are entertainers. I mean, it impact everyone's lives. Every one of our lives were impacted by this in different ways. When you first heard about uh, COVID-19, and it may have been at the time coronavirus, when was it and what was your, your initial response? I learned about it in February, the end of February, um, actually right before I was traveling to Europe. Um, I had planned a trip to market in Paris and I had learned that it had moved from Asia to Italy. And then I knew going into Paris, I knew I would be possibly exposed to people who um, were in Italy during the time that the outbreak, outbreak happened. I had heard about it earlier um, in the year around January, February, when it was a really big problem in China. Um, and at the time, you know, a lot of people were making jokes and, you know, on Instagram, social media, and it seemed like this very far off, distant thing. Um, but the closer we approached to spring break, it started feeling more and more real. Um, I had peers who were getting school canceled or were going to online classes. And I remember the day before, I went um, to Miami for spring break. And so the day before I left for my spring break trip, my friend and I were saying, oh my gosh, do you think we're gonna be able to come back to campus? And we said, well, you know, 
Duke would never just cancel classes and not give us any heads up. Of course, you know, there's going to be a process that happens and, you know, we'll be okay. And so we went on our spring break trip and the night before we were supposed to come back to campus, we get an email that says, do not return to campus. You know, I just thought it was another scare, so to speak, uh, or just another flu, something that's coming about because this is the flu season, you know what I mean? And, uh, uh, I remember how, talking with my brother Raphael was in LA, and we were talking about. It, he's like, "Man, you hear about this and such?" And it's like, "Yeah, isn't it a flu?" You know what I mean? So you know what it is. We triple up on our vitamin C's in the winter time and such, such, such. You know, traveling for so many years, you kind of. I haven't. First of all, I haven't had a flu in like almost twenty years. You know what I mean? So, like, I was just letting you know. I just, I'm just getting over the flu. So. It's just done on me because I haven't been watching the news as much you because know, I don't believe in the everything. So I just, like, so maybe I, shoot, maybe I do have whatever they're talking about. But is it another strand of the flu? Now that you know and now that we're here, what, what are your thoughts about the circumstances? It was definitely scary only because, for me, the scariest part was that it didn't seem like the Chinese government was very open with information at that time about what coronavirus really was, what the symptoms were, the death rate, how it's treated, or any of that. Um, so that was a little bit disheartening. Um, but at the same time, we were kind of reading about how China was throwing up, like, four hospitals it, pretty much overnight to treat it. So... Um, that was a little bit hopeful, I remember being at that time, that it would be kind of nipped in the bud because they were taking, so I thought, such swift action. I definitely see the racial impacts, the inequality as far as resources. Um, and this is stuff that the Black community and also other, you know, brown and immigrant communities, we have been suffering with for a long time. You know, access to health care, access to fresh food, um, healthy food, um, access, you know, um, to financial resources. So what the um, COVID-19 pandem pandemic did was, was pretty much exacerbate all those problems and is bringing to light to even more people, you know, what these problems are and is bringing people together to actually help address them. The reality of the situation is that uh, while obviously this is something that's taken place all around us and it's, it's having a tremendous impact on our business, um, you know, at the end of the day, the, the airport has been deemed essential infrastructure. And so what we've had to do is, is to find a way to continue operating as normally as possible. Um, you may be aware, I think many have heard that uh, travel, air, air traffic, uh, passenger travel is down over 90% nationwide. And that is certainly the case here in Oakland. Uh, so we've had to make some adjustments in terms of uh, all of the, the messaging that we have in place throughout the terminal building. Uh, both in uh, in postings around the terminal building, also with audio messaging, uh, reminding people of all those CDC health guidelines uh, with the social distancing and the washing of hands and uh, keeping your hands away from your face. It often is a lot worse than what we're hearing. Um, I think um, uh, I think we didn't know a lot about what it could become back then, and. Um, uh, what I learned from this process is that all those things I was talking about in February where my friends were saying, it's big, it's, you know, it's, 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 this is very different. It's coming to fruition. So I wonder how much information behind the scenes is equally as dire. And I hate to be gloom and doom about it, but that they're trying to manage the expectations of us in the public with keeping some of that information back um, so that you don't have mass hysteria. I mean, it's, I mean, I think about, you know, all the people who are suffering right now. Um, I don't want to get emotional, but it's to know that um, people are suffering and, and, and dying. Um, and people are also putting their lives at stake and risk for for us, um, I think about the healthcare workers. I think about even just like our UPS driver that comes every day to make sure that businesses are open. Um, you know, it's 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 a tough time.
it's a really tough time. Speaking on the uh, uh, just the shelter in place, the social distancing and the distance distance learning that the students, your children, are now having to do, how has that impacted your your life, your daily life? I would get a lot of calls. Like, Why aren't you closing down school immediately? And there was just this like immediate fear. But I tell you what also was happening for me though, Shonda was like, but what does that mean? And what do we do? And where are kids going to be? Like I immediately was like, and I did, sorry to be pessimistic. Right. I was like, there are kids that are not safe at home. There are kids that do not have homes. And then I was like, I went into the domestic violence issue. Like, I don't, you know, like, I don't know, my stuff was coming up around like, is home safe? And we're saying sheltering in home. So we need to be clear about that and define that. So I was a little bit more on the, the social side of it around, is this going to be healthy for people? Right now we're doing online le distance learning. And I've signed up, all my kids have signed up. I've got all my classes, all six classes, kids are in there. And I've given them like journaling assignments because I really do want them to kind of just take care of themselves during this time because all of our teachers, math, science, English, all of the ele other elective teachers are given tons and tons of work. So they have plenty of work to do, but, and having been in contact with the kids, they are stressed. And I, it, it just, it breaks my heart because they are really stressed right now. So I've given them, my PE assignments, I, I've told them I want them to stay active. So I've given them workouts that I want them to do. But at the same time, I want them to track it. So I'm like, I want to know what time you're, you're waking up. What are you eating all day? What kind of exercises are you doing? How long are you exercising? What time are you going to sleep? How are you feeling? And I really, I've asked them to keep a journal and they turn the journals into me. And then I, you know, I grade the journals and put that toward their PE grade. But really it's more for them than for a grade for me. I just really want them to, to tap into what they're feeling because they don't know. Poor kids, they are blessed their hearts. They're just trying to roll with it, but they are stir crazy. Law school is definitely mentally challenging and emotionally challenging. And what I've found getting through it up until now, um, getting through it has been my network of friends who've be kind of become my family out there, like getting through it together. So the aspect of that being missing has been an interesting adjustment, doing it kind of like law school isolated is, is well, law school isn't fun, but law school while isolated definitely isn't fun. Um, but just kind of adjust to new ways to connect with them on our various time zones has been important. Um, thank God I'm here with my family because that's been a help in terms of my mental health. This whole thing pretty much started with one NBA player testing positive for the coronavirus, and that kind of was a domino effect to shut down college games, pro games, shut down arenas, and then have states declare stay-at-home policies, right? And so, you know, the sports world is always a microcosm of what's going on in the real world, and I just, uh, got a notification today that all of the NBA players from the various teams who were positive, they're all fully recovered now. With the um, disparities in the African American community, and that's part of the lens that we're looking at in our conversations, is do you think that the testing has anything to do with those type of disparities as well? I think the testing really has more to do with the supply of the, the test, more so than um, you know, any sort of racial undertones. I definitely think that the treatment, however, the people are receiving during this pandemic, that that is questionable. I think um, the allocation of resources in states where they have a limited number of, let's say, ventilators or hospital beds um, or the ability to care for people, obviously, we're going to see some racial um biases once this is all said and done we actually have the data and we can take a look at it i have been traveling around as a travel nurse um, all across the country uh, treating persons with the virus and i've seen um, kind of the arc of um, depleted resources and subsequent interventions um, meaning initially there was some uh, ppe or uh, personal protective equipment uh, to shield the worker from the patient. As the virus continued to spread and develop, um, many entities across America um, noticed a shortage of PPE. And so subsequently, 
um, treatment facilities and hospitals begin recycling PPE and um, enacting various protocols uh, to kind of help the, the worker feel more comfortable uh, reusing PPE. Um, initially, there was a lot of caution about um, secluding persons who was positive and um, screening them um, from coming onto wards or units with other patients who were negative. But as the resources depleted, um, including um, places like the morgue that had gotten overwhelmed with bodies, it had gotten to a point to where, um, you know, people expired, they were just left in the room. I've been in um, hospitals where the doctors didn't even come on to the COVID positive units, that they would call to the nurse's station and, you know, we would give our assessments and recommendations and the doctor would provide orders. Um, so it, it has been a, a huge variance in, in my experience from what I've observed um, from the level of care that persons receive. Yeah, I think we better take note again um, in terms of our community, the health disparities is nothing new. Um, this is really bringing it to the, the forefront. Um, as I talk to people from here to Florida and Georgia, um, the sad thing about it is that the, the younger generation is not taking note. My fear is that this thing is going to wipe them out. Um, and because they're still partying, going to the beaches, you know, getting drunk, they're still doing the same thing. And not because, you know, a lot of people thought initially that it couldn't touch the black community. And I couldn't understand that because everybody I saw on TV that was dying was black. If it came out in terms of the establishment, in the sense of how bad it is, you better believe it's much worse. How has that changed your, your family scenario as well as your professional scenarios? Changed my whole world. I mean, nothing is the same. We don't go to the office, but maybe once to record the services on Wednesday and Sunday, but not having a chance to be in fellowship with the other church members and the day-to-day -day routine, it's, it's pretty shocking. I mean, I am dumb, dumbfounded by this whole situation, this shelter-in-place thing. We've never seen anything like this in our lifetime. Yeah, we've seen 9-11 and it changed the way we travel, but for a whole country to be shut down at one time. This is just simply amazing. I, I, I'm, I'm at a loss for words. Well, it's, um, you know, like every business out there, it has greatly impacted, um, greatly impacted our business. We're a small business and we rely heavily on people coming into the stores. Our um, business is very much focused on clients coming in and communicating with them that way. So we've just had to shift how we're doing business. You know, we're really utilizing technology in a way that we hadn't fully been able to use, utilize before. Um, we're focused more on online, you know, sending constant communication out through email, newsletters, using social media as channels, um, IG live chats, really thinking about innovative ways to reach consumers at this time. Um, but at the same time, really thinking about what customers are looking for and really being sensitive to what's happening in the world. And, um, you know, it's like on one hand, I think about, should we be talking about fashion so much when, you know, we're, we're in this crisis. Um, but I also think that, our customers really want to support us because, um, you know, we're very community focused and we're a local business and they care. The shelter in place orders has not impacted me because I'm an essential worker with an essential organization. So actually my work has um, 
intensified. It has also expanded. Not only do we serve on house populations, but also um, our seniors, folks who are disabled, and folks who are immunocompromised. I myself am immunocompromised. I am diabetic, and I was on a call with um, health professionals, and they said diabetes is one of um, the major diseases that folks have who have tested positive for COVID-19. So I was like, oh my goodness, you know, um, I need to protect myself even more. Um, so I have been able to uh, resource um, from community partners more, you know, PPE, the personal protective equipment, um, the mask, the gloves, the hand sanitizer. And I've been taking increased measures to protect myself and it also protects um, the communities that um, I serve. So I'm very aware, you know, of the risk and the risk that I'm putting myself by being in the field. But as far as at the airport, uh, and this goes for the, the Port of Oakland as a whole, the airport is owned and operated by the Port of Oakland. And so there was a, a plan put into place immediately after Alameda County um, instituted the shelter in place order in mid-March. And so since that time, um, we at the airport have been working on the basis of anyone who is able to perform their work at home, then they are expected to work from home. Um, if your duties cannot be performed from home, which for the airport is many of us uh, on the airport staff, then you have to report to to work on site. Uh, if you are working from home, everyone is on a group, group A or group B. If you need to come into the office, you can do that, but only on your day. So, so that's the way we've been functioning since the middle of March. Um, and, and Zoom has become, uh, and WebEx have become, whether we want it or not, our best friends because we're definitely relying on those types of services to stay in touch. There's some, some good things that are coming out of this in terms of us taking more and better advantage of technology that I think we will continue to uh, in the future and we'll be better off for that. But, um, but it's anything but normal in terms of how we're operating. But having said that, I think we're doing an excellent job in um, the, the level of efficiency and effectiveness that we've been able to maintain. In uh, every darkness, there's some light. There is light that comes to the, at the end of darkness. What is the light that you can see that happened in this moment with this pandemic, the shelter in place, and all the circumstances that are surrounding us now? I'm looking for that silver lining <laughs> because all I see right now are thunderclouds. Uh, but uh, again, like like for me, um, I'm I'm discovering. You know, necessity is the mother of invention. So uh, th this takeout stuff that we're doing, um, it, I'm just learning a lot about uh, delivery service and how we can do some things different than we've done in the past. A part of what we're doing right now is, you know, I'm really going back to the basics. I'm going back to, you know, when I started my business and I was talking to customers regularly, you know, I was pulling things for customers. I was in the store. It was when it was just me and a part-time person working. Um, so it's really taken me back to that. Mm, two things. Well, I think people are learning to value what healthcare professionals do on a daily basis more. And just, um, just people in general. I mean, um, everybody who's on the front lines fighting against this, who should be at home with their families, but they're saying, you know, I'm putting someone else's life before mine. I think those are the types of people who, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, people take for granted. And so it's just shedding light on how important their jobs are and how appreciative we should be um, with those people. That God is still the same. Our methods might change, but the, but the message is the same. And it's going to go forth no matter what. Whether we have church on Sunday morning at the Vine or at McClimates on high school, we're still going to preach the word, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that still saves, it still delivers, it still heals, and it still set the captives free. That's the gospel. I've enjoyed, what I've enjoyed about this time uh, being uh, with the kids being at home is that I really feel like we... Um, have been able to do some things as a family that we weren't able to do before. Um, because of all of the kids' activities, working, Bible studies, it was pretty rare that we would be able to all sit down and have a meal together outside of like a Sunday. 
And now we're having dinner together, uh, you know, every night. What I've seen so far that has actually been um, very positive is unity. I see so many different people talking across so many different sectors who have either never, who have never talked before. Um, and we are, we are working together more. Um, I see more of our black leaders. Um, I see more, more coalitions formed. I've, I've seen um, the philanthropic um, sector shift gears and fund people who they probably would have never um, funded before. Um, I see the work of different groups being recognized and that work may have never been recognized before or more so um, there wasn't funding for really the, some of the frontline direct service work. Um, so having report more support there, if people are donating their um, stimulus packages you know, to nonprofit organizations, um, I've seen so much mutual aid you know, across the, the country. Um, I can't even keep track of all this, the spreadsheets and all the announcements that I have seen about um, different resources and, and different supports, whether it's, you know, you're a low income individual, whether you are on house or whether you're housing insecure or whether you are a resident of color, you know. Um, so, and then, you know, I've seen direct uh, financial assistance. So like more opportunities to actually put money into hands of people who are suffering financially. Everybody was suffering together, so everybody was in this together, no matter big, small, whatever level, any level, it was all at the same level at the time. And so that became the light at the end of the tunnel that we all had to come together around. The numbers of cases were skyrocketing across America, especially in the black community. I had the opportunity to talk to several people who had COVID-19 and were fortunate to survive. When you first found out you had COVID-19, did you notice any symptoms prior to the diagnosis? So. The initial symptoms, um, I would say, um, I felt like uh, it was like a like a chest cold, right? So it felt like like I would take deep breaths, like, and I would cough immediately. I couldn't hold my breath, um, but I had something similar to it last year, and so I felt like I actually felt like it was just a repeat of what I had last year. Um, obviously, it turned out to be much more um, uh, crucial. And um, and so I found out, uh, like I said, I was just coughing um, and not able to, not necessarily not able to breathe, but it was, um, let's say like about the week of, let's see, I went in the hospital on March 21st, Saturday, March 21st, um, but the week prior to, um, I almost can actually document, you know, where I was the week prior to, and about the Wednesday, uh, I take that back, about the Sunday, which would have been about the 15th of March, um, I started feeling really, really bad and fatigued, um, uh, a little bit of nausea and just everything, you know, like I've been very fortunate uh, in my life that I haven't had a, you know, a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, sickness and, and been relatively healthy, but I felt really bad. And so by about mm, Wednesday of that week, I started Tell my wife, I think I need to go to the hospital. Like something isn't right. Sort of in the back of my mind, I was, you know, you know, mm, nah, no way. That it couldn't be COVID. It couldn't be. But as it got to be, as it, you know, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I started feeling worse and worse. And so finally, on that Saturday, the twenty first, we went to the hospital. We just had a great time the whole week. I know four people that passed, and I partied and speed with them all week. Nothing. I only know one guy that went to the hospital, but he has some other conditions. So he ended up having coronavirus, but he had been to the hospital for something else before. Only one person I knew like that, but everybody else, the ones that passed away, nothing, not a, not a thing. Now, when I got home, I went, um, I got home on Saturday the second, I believe. No, wait, Saturday the seventh or something like that. And about, and I played golf on Wednesday with the guys I play golf with. 
We used to play golf every Wednesday. And then on, I was gone Friday, man, I just, I just left. I, I was fatigued. I couldn't walk 10 steps to the restroom without collapsing on, you know, sitting down. When I, I it had, took me a hard time to get back to my bed. When I got to the bed, I could just, I just fall on the bed. And my wife said, you gotta, you, you gotta go to the hospital. We came to the hospital and left me in the, and they said, okay, stay right here, stay in the car. <laughs> We're going to get a bed for you. We're going to take you straight upstairs. And when they took me upstairs, that's when they, they started treating me right away. They took the test and started treating me. Before they even got the results back, they started treating me for it. So I think that was, and that was I, I'm sure that was a good thing. So they didn't wait or send me back home or anything, which I, a lot of people have been sent back home with this thing, you know. A lot of people have been called bronchitis, and it wasn't. I just, just got to be lucky, it seems like. I found out that I was um, infected with COVID-19. Um, I think it was around the top of August. However, in hindsight, I was experiencing symptoms since the beginning of July. Um, and those symptoms were um, namely some irritation in my throat. I'm an asthmatic, and so I'm very sensitive and attuned when I have respiratory infections. Um, and so it felt like I was getting a chest cold because there was this little tingle in the bottom of my throat. Um, I broke out with a fever and I was just exhausted. I couldn't breathe and I was totally exhausted. Um, and I was talking to my uncle and I told him, everything is so salty. I said, I can't eat anything. Everything is so salty. And he's the one who told me, you have COVID. I went uh, for diagnostics at a local hospital. And they uh, said that uh, my left lung in particular was about 80% um, occluded with infiltrates, which is a bacteria, if you will, or um, growth rather, um, where the lung is full of growth, foreign growth, whether it's bacterial or viral, um, and that I had full-blown pneumonia that I didn't know about. Um, it was recommended that I go upstairs and be admitted to the hospital, that they had a COVID positive unit, um, and they would treat me well, and that they had resources if they weren't able to get on top of my pneumonia and uh, if I required intubation that they actually had ventilators um, available to do that. Um, because of my experience providing care across the country as it relates to COVID-19, um, I decided to take my chances at home. And so at that time, I asked for prescriptions um, to treat you know, uh, associated symptoms. And then I left against uh, medical advice. I was just like, oh, I don't, I don't feel good. I could still smell. Um, I had a slight runny nose. So I still didn't think COVID because I did not have a headache. I didn't have a fever and I could still smell. So I just didn't make that connection still yet. Now I'm on day five. And she brought a humidifier and the robotussin with the coating. Worst thing that I could have ever done. Because as soon as I took it, it suppressed the cough. Once the cough was suppressed, now my lungs are filling up with mucus. Because when your body coughs, it's the defense mechanism to keep whatever is trying to get in your lungs out. So it's just like a pump. It just pumps it right back out of the lung. But now I didn't do something to suppress that. So now it's just mucus, mucus, mucus. And now I can't breathe at all. And so I call my little sister and I'm like, I need to go to the hospital. So they called the ambulance. The ambulance came. 
They didn't want to bring the bed into my house. They wanted me to walk out. And by this time, I was able to make it to my couch, which is like right by my front door. I couldn't even walk the five steps to get to the front door where the paramedic was like waiting to grab my hand to help me down my two little stairs to get on the gurney. I'm just telling you, it, it was like, I had been smoking for a, like a hundred packs of cigarettes for like 70 years. It was like, I could not walk. And I'm, <gasps> can't breathe. By the time I get into the ambulance where they could hook me up to see what my oxygen level was, then it became more dire, like, let's hurry up and get going. Meter on your finger for your to measure your oxygen level. And I was like at like an 86. And so, yeah, he was like, yeah, we're gonna have to put you on a ventilator. So now I'm in full panic mode because I've been watching CNN and I've been seeing these people on the ventilators, like that image. I didn't see a reflection of myself as a black woman. Every time the news media was showing coronavirus, it was older white um, Americans. And, and how long were you hospitalized? Do you recall anything that happened while you were in the hospital? Or were you aware that you were in the hospital? It was not until like maybe day three that I saw my fingernails and the polish had grew so far away from the cuticle that I knew then you've been here for a while because you almost look like the color on your nails could be a French manicure. And so then now I'm like, well, how long have I been here? And then that's when they was like, oh, you know, um, you you don't you don't have to go to dialysis anymore. I'm like, dialysis? What? In my mind, because I have a trach in my throat and I can't talk. So I knew that something traumatic had happened to me, but I still just thought it was the next day. And I'm woke. And it wasn't until the main doctor that was overseeing me, he came in and then he let me know that um, I was a miracle and that I was a fighter. And he was like, you fought so hard to survive. And I'm still like, well, what the hell I survived? And then that's when he let me know coronavirus. I was on the ventilator for 10 days. Um, but prior to that, like a couple of days prior to that, um, just remember thinking, um, you know, you don't ever expect me. And there's no way I expected to be in the hospital for a month. And so I kind of figured eventually I was going to be, you know, discharged. And um, yeah, just, the, you know, those first couple of days, just kind of feeling like, wow, I, I, I can't believe, you know, I have, you know, coronavirus or COVID-19. Um, very surreal. So it turned out that I had uh, pneumonia in both lungs, right? And um, uh, things were pretty bad. And, you know, you know, like I said, by the grace of God, I, I have to say that it was, you know, very close to the other side. I'll just leave it at that. And I have an amazing um, uh, pulmonary doctor um, who, quite honestly, he's been very, you know, um, transparent. He said at the time, it was so new. Um, I was basically like his second case that, that he had dealt with. And so you may have heard of a, a medicine that they're using called Remnivir. And Remnivir, he, he um, used Remnivir just you know, kind of on a whim, actually, just trying to, you know, sort of, you know, on a, on a hope that this works. Um, and it worked. 
The severity of my infection, um, I would say was severe. Again, 80% of my left lung was occluded, meaning I only had function of 20% of my lung and there was talk of ventilation. Um, I began exhibiting symptoms around the beginning of July. I became bedridden um, by the beginning of August. Um, I lost 15 pounds uh, during the course of my illness. Um, and I was so fatigued and so exasperated uh, by lack of oxygen that I couldn't even bathe myself. I didn't bathe for seven days. I had pneumonia and was on antibiotics for 10, 12 days. I was laying on a bath towels because I was sweating so profusely. It was difficult for me to, um, so it was difficult for me to maintain adequate um, oxygenation for myself just to kind of live, you know, mm -hmm. to, to survive. Um, if you imagine the lungs as an air sac or, or a bag, 80% of that bag was not functional. It was filled with, um, with solid matter. Instead of air, it was filled with solid matter. So I literally only had 20% of that entire bag left to breathe and to, to survive with. Wow. So I couldn't speak in full sentences um, and I could only text. Uh, to get my communication across. Because I had pneumonia, I also had a cough. And um, sometimes with the force of um, coughing, it increases the demand of oxygenation when you inhale. But I couldn't um, meet that demand sometimes. And so I'd get dizzy and woozy um, to the point of um, where I would, you know, almost pass out oh my goodness we're i'm very close with my um my children my godchildren i mean my grandchildren and my wife and for her to be here at home by herself and then i couldn't see them they couldn't see me it was pretty tough but they, they handled it very well because i kept in touch with them and i would tell them how i, I would tell them honestly how i felt how things were going uh, they were very worried. I had just turned 43. And within 13 days of that, I'm in the hospital in a coma. My kidney shut down first. Then I had, well, I had pneumonia. So coronavirus, pneumonia, kidney failure blood clot on my main artery, trach in my throat, and I'm on a ventilator. And every time they try to get me off the ventilator, my heart would stop. Or every time they tried to clear the mucus out, my heart would stop. And they didn't understand why. The longer you are in a coma and on that ventilator, the worse it is for your body. But there's a medicine that they give you when you're in a coma that takes the oxygen. All the oxygen in your body goes to your brain and heart because those are the two most important things. And when they're not working, it, you know, that's when they give the family the not so great news. How has your recovery been? since you uh, have recovered from COVID-19? What's been the process? Do you have any lingering symptoms? As I feel absolutely nothing from it at all. I walked 18 holes every Wednesday. I walked yesterday 18 holes playing golf with the guys. And I don't feel tired after I get done or anything. So it's, it's, um, I, I feel no effects now at all that I ever had it. I'm doing physical therapy um, a couple times a week, and that's just to help strengthen my lungs. And again, you know, consistent like um, walking the uh, the neighborhood I live in, and you know, trying to do like light uh, cardio to help you know again strengthen the lungs and you know breathing and such. The most difficult lingering effect that I've had have been my feet the nerve damage in my feet. 
because it's healing from the inside out. The best way I could describe that feeling if you're a female is like contractions. It's like really sharp shooting pain that can come from one toe all the way literally up to your chest, like to your heart, like, ooh. So that's been the most difficult part for me. Then comes the emotional. The PTSD and the anxiety is still there. It's, it's, just, it's just different from when I first came home. When I first came home, I didn't want to go to sleep because I felt like I wasn't going to wake up again. But then as I realized that, oh, God, don't let me stay a little while longer. Okay, I'm going to start going to sleep. But now it's the anxiety of people. It doesn't matter. Child, my mom, I, everybody is a suspect. Because you don't know who's come around them, where they've been, and what they've done. The effect that COVID-19 has had on my psychological wellness um, is profound, far more impactful than on my physical wellness. Um, while I was battling the symptoms, um, I thought I could die. Um, and that made me reflect on the choices that I've made in my life thus far. Um, am I fulfilled? Who am I? What is fulfilling to me? Um, am I proud of the choices I made? Would I make different choices? And um, after COVID-19, um, I had the opportunity to revisit those thoughts again and, um, and answer those questions. That um, up until that point in time, I was making decisions and choices for temporary joy, some momentary happiness that I really wasn't in alignment with uh, making decisions that were fulfilling to me and my spirit, my soul. Um, and since then, I've made a promise to myself that from here on out, I would make choices that are in alignment with fulfillment of my inner self, of my being, of my spirit, my soul. And a lot of people still don't understand how bad this really is. I've never, ever felt anything. I've had the flu, colds. I've had everything you think of, but nothing to take me down like this. Nothing. What was the hospital bill during your your stay when you were hospitalized for the for COVID-19? And how much did your insurance cover? Was it covered under your insurance, or do you have bills that you didn't have before? Uh, my bills are upwards of $500,000, right? Um, insurance does cover some, but, you know, as a matter of fact, there's a, a shameless plug. There's a actually GoFundMe page that was created by uh, uh, the frat, actually, um, to sort of help offset some of the, the bills. And how has this ordeal changed your outlook just on life in general? Everything's beautiful now. You can't take it for granted. My grandchildren, you know, and just everything. Everybody's got bikes now. We're all doing bikes now. We, everybody's riding. A lot of family stuff, you know. My impact on life is that I just want to enjoy everything. So I, I, just, uh, I just hope everybody still wears a mask and uh, takes care of themselves. Because if you haven't had it, oh, my God, it's terrible. It's just terrible. And to lose four friends that was just skiing, and partying with who were fine. And by the end of March, they're, they're all gone. Unbelievable. I have a 14 year old and, and with all the things that are going on in the world right now, you know, that's where I feel like, you know, that's my strongest suit. You know, one of the things is just pass along information and try to um, help the next generation navigate some of the things that are going on. It is just a nasty virus. And I felt like I needed to get all my ducks in a row to be able to share my story with my community as I learned it, right? 
And everybody wanted to know like what was wrong. And I just didn't want to tell them because I'm like, I want to get everything. So when I tell the story, it's like boom, 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 boom. And then I'm gonna show them what television never shows us. Right? So that's how I end up sharing it. And I just only wanted to be able to help one person. If it just saved one person, if only one person watched the video, I was totally fine with that. But to know that it reached people who weren't even on Facebook were able to call me, email me, text me, um, and tell me that they solved my story because somebody shared it with them. And, um, you know, almost 10,000 people had watched that one video. Now that America's reopening, what advice would you give people uh, on how to adjust to the new normal? Now that you know what you know about the impact that COVID-19 has on uh, a person's mental and physical life. Oh, man, it's tough. I, I, they, should, they should stay home. But I know everybody can't stay home and everybody won't stay home. Just be careful. And I'm tired of getting on Facebook and seeing all these people talking about their loved ones have passed. And we have to, as a, a the Black community, whether we know each other or not, we have to educate each other. Carry extra masks if you see young, young, young men and women out with no mask. Give them a mask. My best analogy is the mask. Coronavirus is like HIV or AIDS because you can transmit it through interaction, right? The mask is like a condom. That's what you use to protect yourself. Travel, get tested before you go, get tested before you come back. So you know where you at. But most of all, take the time to quarantine and, and not go into public if you're going to travel. That's really all I can say, you know. But the most important message I can say is get vaccinated. Your health is your wealth. That, that's the most important thing that anybody should be able to take away from here is get your health, health in order. COVID-19 is impacting all of our lives. No one has not been touched by this disease. And even if you didn't have the disease, you've been touched, your life's been touched somehow or another. No one's gone untouched. So I realize that, but then when you talk to a survivor of a virus that's killing hundreds of thousands and millions of people in the world, you realize that this is a real situation. And to hear their stories and just how invisible this disease is and how it's taken out lives the way it is, you realize the seriousness of it when you put a face to a disease or a virus. And faces that look like people that you know, people in your family, any circumstance that you could imagine this virus has impacted those people. They were just at an event and something happened or they just were with their friends and family and you realize the importance of wearing a mask and how that protects not only you but others and you realize the seriousness of it when you can put a face to this disease or illness or virus that's happening and this pandemic. And it made me uh, it also gave me some hope too, because you realize that what the people had gone through and you realize that they are like walking miracles that they survived it. If they have hope in the midst of a pandemic, we all should have hope, but then we also have to do what we need to do to protect one, uh, one another. In July of 2020 in California, Governor Newsom gave businesses the green light to open up with limited capacity. And restaurants with outdoor seating began to open up. 
And it felt like a good time for us to circle back with some of the people that I spoke with during the beginning of the pandemic, just to see how they were dealing with this new normal. Now that we're under shelter in place, how has your life and your business been impacted during this COVID-19 pandemic? Cyber church experience has been wonderful. Um, and it has, it has given me like another level of excitement around ministry again. So I can't see myself just going back doing the regular standard quote. Uh, I think we're going to press forward and we're all in. So what that looks like for our church going forward in the future, I really don't have all of the, the, the nuances worked out, but it is something that we are in conversation about. So I really try to take the things that I'm passionate about. Um, and like my professor said, you know, really find how you can make quality experiences from home. And so, you know, I've tried to do that through school. Um, and then with friends, you know, like how do we work out together over the phone to still keep in touch? Or how do we make sure that we have at least like one Zoom call a week where we, you know, catch up or things like that. So I've really tried to change my perspective on those things um, and adapt. And, you know, it's been going, it's been getting better now, but it was, it was a rough few weeks at first trying to just cope with the fact that you don't know if you're going back to school. Mostly working from home. I mean, I need to go in a couple of times, maybe once or twice a month to sign some stuff. But really, I'm able to do everything from here, which is really great and a blessing, um, frankly. Yeah, mm -hmm. my, whole, my whole team at work is able to do that, which makes me happy because everybody can stay safe and we can still do what we need to do. I got uh, a number of calls from people within the community that said, hey, man, if you open up, uh, we'll support you. So I took a chance, I opened up a little bit slowly and um, people were coming, people were being supportive. And so I said, I'll be a little bit more aggressive and you know, give this thing a go from a takeout and delivery standpoint. And from that point, I've been doing about 20, 25% of what we ordinarily do. The bills are still at 80 to 100%, but some of them have been deferred. We have meal prepping that's worked out. Now what can we do next? How can we take that and, and pivot that into something else? What can we add to that to keep it fresh? What can we do to make it, um, you know, put another level on it or some other sort of profit center, you know, and, and keep going? Because as much as World Central Kitchen is needed, and it was needed even without this pandemic. We heard that 18,000 kids in Oakland Unified were going to go hungry if they didn't go to school when schools got shut down. Um, and, and so we decided that we wanted to work alongside Oakland Unified School District to help them and enhance their capacity to continue serving meals. So they did their part to continuing cooking breakfast and lunch for, for the kids. And we supplemented that by bringing other partners to help provide additional meals for the families. Uh, we're also, because of the shelter in place, businesses were shut down and we found families, parents that lost their jobs. So all of a sudden there was, it was an economic issue where they couldn't afford food as well. So we wanted to make sure that we serve the whole family uh, in the community, uh, not only through OUSD, but again, starting to look at other partners out there that were serving uh, a broader set of families. The partnership with Wall Central Kitchen was one that we just, we were really excited about. Um, you know, Aisha, as a chef herself, had a connection to, um, to Chef Jose Andres, who's the founder of World Central Kitchen. And they had a conversation and um, they talked about the initiative called Restaurants for the People. And Aisha and Stephen said, you know, one, we care about meals getting to families, everything from the homeless population to seniors, elders, foster youth, anyone who needs a meal now. We want to make sure they get served. And two, it was an economic uh, strategy as well, because during the shelter in place, all these restaurants in Oakland got shut down and uh, they were not operating. Some of them kept going with some of the takeout service, but what a great strategy to feed the community using an amazing asset that we have, like an Oakland, like a restaurant 
that uh, can prepare healthy, nutritious meals and serve them to the community and to those people that need the most. So um, we, we, we took a, a big uh, leap and effort to reach out to World Central Kitchen and said, we, we love what you're doing, but we want to do it bigger here in Oakland. Everything from small cafes to larger, more established restaurants and everything in between that are now serving 85,000 meals per week. And uh, as of last week, we have done about a million meals um, to the Oakland community, which means that about 10 million in uh, economic relief effort, really because we pay the restaurants for the meals, uh, was put into the Oakland economy. And on top of that, um, of these 130 restaurants, they have re-employed about 800 people from their kitchen staff. So for us, it was a, it was a way to really address the need for food, but also in a way to activate and uh, bring economic security to an industry like restaurants who otherwise have, would have been potentially out of business. Just tell me a little bit about how your daily routine has changed now that we're under the shelter in place mandate. And we made some adjustments pretty quickly with the school in terms of their um, their schoolwork because it was very clear that in addition to the challenges of now being homeschooled that our kids, my, my kids were also dealing with the challenge of their mother going to work in this hospital where the, the virus is and how that was an extra layer of stress um, and anxiety for our children um, that other children didn't have. I have a lot of time to hang out with the kids. So we've been hiking, taught him how, taught Zach how to ride his bike in one day. And we hadn't had time to do that. And it was that, that right there, this whole pandemic experience, that right there was like the best moment I have had since all of this has occurred. My family being able to spend more time with my son. I mean, I was traveling so much for work. I was, you know, every month I was gone on a business trip. So it's been really nice to just like hang out with my kid um, all day, even though I was homeschooling and trying to work, there were some challenges with that. But overall, I mean, it's, you know, listen, I had three home cooked meals every day. I was cooking a lot more, hanging out with my family. It was, um, it was all good in that, in that sense. And now how has the shelter in place and this pandemic shutdown impacted your business revenue? The Oakland Airport is flying at roughly 25% of its total number of passengers right now, and that's a high. Um, so as you can imagine, um, the concessionaires, the airlines, we're struggling on that part. So the port is actually thinking that we're going to face about a $100 million annual revenue decrease between the end of this fiscal year, within, which ended June 30th, and then all throughout next year, fiscal year. So until next June 30th, we're looking at $100 million less in revenue. Now I'm only open uh, from 4 to about 7.30. So that changes everything and changes how the day is structured. It's also put a total damper on um, our alcoholic beverages sales. The financials don't work. They don't pencil out for you to have a full-time bartender there for that period of time. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit different. But again, uh, now that I've seen the support, I want to be more aggressive on those. And um, I think in about two weeks, I'm going to offer on a regular basis uh, takeout cocktails. We were definitely impacted. Significant decrease in sales um, because our stores both stores were closed, obviously. So <clears throat> the online part of our business was not the biggest part of our business. It was a smaller percentage of our overall sales. Uh, brick and mortar is just where we do the bulk of our business. Um, but now we've really, like I said, we, we had some time over the last few months to really rethink how we do business going forward, what makes sense for the overall sustainability and growth and all of those things. <clears throat> um, but we definitely were impacted financially. There's, I, absolutely. Uh, I have a deferment 
But the real challenge is that uh, at some point the bill is going to come due. So you'll be, you, I would be in a situation where I have the current rent that will be due and then I'll have to pay the deferred rent and you'll be paying that with a maximum of 50% of the revenue that you could generate. So that's a business model that's not viable. And so my hope is that landlords, commercial landlords, renters, banks, cities uh, have to get together in some way to figure out how to be able to spread this over a period of time. It's four months into shelter in place shutdown, a global pandemic, and the world witnessed the horrific murder of an unarmed black man. Police officer has his knee on his neck, and George Floyd, we watched, is murdered on camera. Black people have watched Breonna Taylor murdered in her home, asleep in her bed. Then there's Ahmaud Aubrey, who was chased down viciously as black men have been chased down in this country and lynched. This man is murdered in the streets. The, the, the numbers of black people dying and getting COVID-19 and suffering is, is astronomical. So all the disparities that black people have dealt with since 400 years of ins being here as enslaved people. In the 21st century, in a new decade, 2020, still going through this suffrage and now the world sees it. And now we have social justice movement happening and unrest. How does that impact you personally? This was really um, challenging for me um, because if you know me, I'm someone who's very, very big on activism. I'm always usually out there in protest and getting involved in the community and doing all of this stuff. But with um, Corona, I um, live with my grandmother. And so I did not want to be involved in these protests that could potentially, you know, have a really negative effect on her if I were to get sick. And so it was really hard for me to see um, all this unfold and to just sit back and not be a part of it and to feel like I couldn't do anything to really be heard. I've been fortunate enough, even when I had Pecan in Oakland, through every single uh, civil unrest or protest or demonstration, I have not been harmed. But I took some proactive measures. I did put out there Black Lives Matter. I did put on part of the community. Actually, when I'm there, I reach out. I had water for protesters. Um, uh, when I did have, I put out some chips and stuff. So uh, I welcome the protests and uh, I hope we just do it in a smart way and take that protest to the ballot box. Nothing has really um, impeded port business um, on the maritime property. Um, we haven't seen excessive looting or anything on property. Uh, we had a little bit of, you know, uh, window shattering, you know, at BevMo, but minimal, very, very minimal um, related. Loop. So nothing has really, um, uh, but positivity, I think, with regard to this movement, have we experienced as a port. And I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of that. We were really lucky that after the first um, protest, my business and my neighbor next door uh, two black owned businesses were not impacted and I didn't have my business boarded and neither did she. And we, I mean, absolutely nothing happened to our business. So we were really lucky because I know that there are, there were several businesses that were impacted and broken glass graffiti. But I have to say like going out, um, just on Broadway, just seeing so many people come together and wanting to help and make sure that the businesses were okay, like everyone was safe. Um, I mean, we saw so many volunteers just 
removing graffiti and removing writing off of the buildings. They were scrubbing the buildings that morning. And to see our community come together like that was um, like, I was really, I was really proud of, um, I was really proud of that. If you're constantly hearing, this is my story, this is my experience, and this is how I'm being negatively impacted by the systems that exist. Um, when you always hear those perspectives and those voices, you almost can't stop working towards change because you know there's somebody out there who is constantly being negatively impacted by someone else's decision to not stand up and to not speak up. Well, since our first interview, how has your outlook on life and what's happening in the world changed? As a medical professional, I, my outlook is bleaker now than it was in the beginning. I really felt that the virus was not going to be with us for as long. It was not going to be as impactful as it has been. And that by this time, we would have um, seen a dramatic drop off in the number of cases and the infectivity rate and its tr impact on our lives. Um, but that's not true. We're actually more impacted. We are going to see it prolong for the foreseeable year, this year and next year. So I think, um, yes, there is a constant, uh, a, a conscious change that I have made. Um, I'm, you know, I'm trying to give people more grace, right? You know, I'm trying to, um, acknowledge that when you approach a person with mask on, of course, that's what we're trying to roll with is mask on, that there's a lot going on behind that mask that wasn't there before. And so when you just everyday stuff, when you're at the grocery store and, you know, the line doesn't seem to be going as fast as it needs to be going and you don't know what's up with that person who is checking you out. It just seems like they're taking a while. Well, give that person a little grace. I'm hopeful, but I'm cautiously hopeful and I'm realistic. Like I said, the situation that I'm in personally, the business model just does not work. It, it's not a viable business model when the maximum of what you can generate financially in terms of sales doesn't match up with the fact that uh, all of the debt is still at 85 to 100 percent. So that doesn't match up. And unless something happens that doesn't exacerbate that, that, that helps you address that, um, I, I don't see a viable pathway forward. But there really is going to have to be a program for small businesses, or we're going to get totally to the homogenization of uh, America which means there are no more small businesses and they're just big chains. And I don't think that that's what will make America uh, be what it has been. You have to, you have to thrive. I mean, you definitely have to survive, but you want to thrive. So you have to start thinking out and testing those things. Some of the, your ideas aren't going to work. And then some of them will work, but you have to, as an entrepreneur, you just have to keep, always looking ahead and trying and trying new things. I don't think the restaurant industry is going to be what it once was for a long time. Some of these businesses, especially small businesses, uh, um, really understand that they need to operate differently. Uh, because if it's not COVID, it's gonna be some other crisis that comes in, the, in later that's gonna affect the way they, they operate. So everything from the way their business model works. You know, take restaurants, which we're talking about right now, for example. Um, you know, how are we also helping restaurants rethink their business model so that they do more, integrate more technology into their business, whether it's, you know, to more online ordering, online presence, um, but, but they really need to rethink their business model. So all I can say is that we are definitely walking by faith because we definitely don't know what we're seeing right now and sometimes what we see can be distracting it can make us depressed it can it can give us all of these anxieties and 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 the community is feeling those anxieties 
And so as a shepherd, pastor, leader of a church and a community, and a husband and a father, you know, I, at this moment, I have to make sure that I'm not showing signs of cracking. So I have to depend on God because it's a faith walk right now. It's a, it's a journey of seeing how much faith you have in believing what the word says about you. People became a, a little bit disenchanted with what is life because you want to get back to some sense of normalcy, but we're, it's not there yet. Because And we still are going to have to go through that even after things are opened up again, because we are living in a world of post-COVID-19, meaning like now we know this virus exists amongst us. And if we don't do what we need to do to protect ourselves, we could be closed down a, a completely again. So the real key and all, and all of this turmoil that's going on is what's going to happen with the election. Less than a year after the global pandemic started, a vaccine was created faster than ever before. The federal, state, and local governments partnered with churches to serve as healing places vaccinating our communities. So I understand completely why people are skeptical and hesitant to believe anything that comes out of the mouth of healthcare providers. And I think that's where people like me who are doctors and who are black um, or brown will come in and really be able to educate our community. I don't believe that they would kill all the doctors off and all the nurses off just to kill us, you know, because they have to take the vaccine first. So, you know, I'm gonna wait till my wife gets hers and then. <laughs> <laughs> I got mine at True Vine Ministries, where Pastor Zach and Dr. Donna are the leaders. Schools are opening up, offices are opening up, and businesses are opening up. However, there are some businesses and places that will not reopen. However, in the midst of the closures and the non-reopening, there will be a new breath of life where people will start new businesses and churches will change how they serve their communities with their now massive online presence. And we have a new administration in office that are providing resources to sustain and bring equity to our communities. In this moment, I truly believe that we can use this change as an opportunity for us to build an America and world that is stronger and better for all.
Thank you.